think it needs to manage from your department. Right. Yeah. 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 I'll ask the city clerk to do a roll call. Good evening, Mayor. Um, Council Member Barton is not joined us quite yet. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Landrum. Here. And Mayor Wixom. Here. With that, we'll take a moment of silence. Thank you. And Chief McCrane, will you lead us in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with and justice for all. <laughs> Me. I call this. He's leading you astray. Thank you everyone for joining us. What a beautiful day in Morro Bay. We will start with closed session report, Mr. Newmeyer. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. Uh, no legally required reporting from closed session today, but at direction of city council, uh, I was asked to report that there was discussion about the disposition of the real estate 781 Market Street uh, owned by the city of Morro Bay. Um, council wanted me to remind the public that the city has been seeking the sale of this property for about almost 10 years now. Um, there currently is a lease right now, a two-year lease on the site that expires in August of 2025 with a 60-day notice to terminate for either party. No decisions were made in closed session today, and the city council is continuing to look at the future of this real estate that the city owns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neumeyer. And I would just add to that that um, all of us on the council are appreciative of the correspondence we received. We did receive numerous letters um, from uh, supporters of the yoga studio, and we just want to acknowledge that we did all receive those emails. So thank you. Um, I would share that our city manager is not here in person this evening. She will be joining us or is joining us right now via Zoom. She is in San Diego at an executive summit that's put on by our insurance company, CJPIA. So thank you to her for attending that. And um, tentatively scheduled June 12th to the 14th, the California Coastal Commission's meeting will be held on the Central Coast. With that, I will start at my left with Council Member Edwards. Um, so I wanted to remind people who live in North Morro Bay between uh, San Jacinto and Highway 41 that I will be having uh, my listening session this coming Sunday, uh, April 14th from 1 to 3 at the rec center um, in the studio room. There's still uh, available spots. And um, if you'd like to join some of your neighbors in this session, you can also RSVP to me at C. Edwards at Morro Bay, California with a CA.gov. Um, I also uh, got some correspondence with regard to a comment that I made at the previous meeting and I wanted to address it. Um, I mentioned that I felt that there was not as much attendance at the Vistra hosted event um, that I was at a couple weeks ago. And I wanted to speak to what I meant by that. It was not meant to be um, any sort of disrespect toward people who chose to go there or not go there. It was coming from me uh, wanting to be um, available to hear as many voices as I can possibly hear as we go through um, the process of this um, project before us. Um, and so whether I'm at a Vistra hosted event with regards to the battery storage um, project at hand, or it's at a city held event, I think 
the people that I am wanting to hear from the most are you, members of our community. Um, I also want to say that I was reminded by the people that reached out to me that not everybody is able to attend a council meeting or an informational meeting. And um, it was a good reminder for me to think about the fact that there are people in the community who are watching from home and who are listening and maybe are not corresponding and um, because they can't or they have family members they're taking care of, they're not getting off work in time, whatever the numerous reasons could be. Um, so it also gave me an opportunity to want to remind people that if you aren't able to physically attend one of our meetings, um, you are more than welcome to phone in, to Zoom in. Um, you can correspond with us uh, via email. Um, and the other option would be, uh, and I've mentioned this before, is if you can't make it yourself, it's always great to have a neighbor or a friend, you know, give them something, a written correspondence, and they can come and deliver it on your behalf. So there's multitudes of ways to do this, and I just wanted to remind people of that and to also say oh, thank you for reminding me that we do have people at home watching and who are learning and listening and coming to their own conclusions on um, the items that hand so thank you thank you all right thank you for that Council Member Edwards um I um, just have one thing to talk about um I attended a really I'm going to say nifty because I think that's appropriate for the word um to describe yesterday's event I attended the Morrow Bay celebrates generations at the historic Morrow Bay theater um it was an event that uh, supported so many nonprofits here locally um, that I don't even have the full list, but uh, several like the Historical Society, the Chamber, um, Friends of uh, Morro Bay Harbor Department, uh, so on and so forth. But anyway, they did a showing of the movie, if you haven't seen it, The Mad, Mad, Mad World, <laughs> or It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World. And I had never seen that before. And wow, that was definitely an experience. Um, all, all the famous um, comedians from the past were in this, had at least a cameo in it. So anyway, it was great to see the theater filled with um, happy faces all there to support great causes whatever their cause may be. Um, so I was very excited to be a part of that and to witness that happen. So um, I just wanted to leave you with that. Hopefully there'll be more of these types of situations, more of these types of fundraisers, because it was just a really fun way to get together and celebrate our community. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> um, I want to let people know that there's going to be um, um, a public comment writing workshop that will be held um, in, in a series of two at the library in Morro Bay um, that, that will help people um, if anyone wants to make a public comment on things such as the draft EIR for the um, battery storage um, plant in Morro Bay, for instance. Um, that will be held um, on April 20th from 10 to 12 at the library and also on May 11th from 2 to 4. And um, if you would like to go, you can RSVP by text to Jean Marie Colby and her phone number is 650-773-1381. Also on the next day, um, on April 21st, that Sunday, April 21st, I will be having my town hall meeting, my next town hall meeting. Um, and that, again, that topic is, um, what is your vision for Morro Bay? And, um, um, you know, we have a lot of things coming up in Morro Bay, the, the proposed battery storage, the proposed offshore wind uses, um, as well as um, Market Street, um, property that's coming up. Um, that is another thing downtown. What do we want to see down at downtown? So, um, yeah, if you're interested in that, please come to my town hall meeting at the community center from two to four on Sunday, the 21st. And then also just for, um, um, I had the, um, privilege yesterday of going to, um, I took my mom and my sister to let's get tuned for my mom's birthday yesterday and um, we did a yoga class there and I just want to encourage everyone to who hasn't to really take if you're curious at all take advantage of that because it's 
the most beautiful. I've done a lot of yoga and that is the most beautiful place to do it. I mean, I, I couldn't, I, I mean, you just can't take your eyes off of the, the bay while you're, you know, you're in a pose. It's just, it's spectacular really. And they have, they do sound features in, in regular yoga classes as well. And all, and this week they have um, Tibetan monks that are um, in town and they're, they're creating a mandala out of sand. And when I was there, there was, it was a blank slate and they had big protractors out and they were, they were drawing their design and they had all their sand out. So every day through Thursday, they're going to keep adding to it. And then on Thursday, they're going to destroy it to show the impermanence of everything. So you can just go in and look at that. And I encourage everyone to do that. Thank you. That's my report. Um, I had the pleasure of talking with your mom today and hearing how much she had enjoyed that um, outing. So that was fun. Um, I too attended the uh, Mad, 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 Mad World uh, showing last night. And it was, um, I originally saw it when I was in fifth grade. So this was the only the second time I had seen it. And it was such a fun movie. It really was a kick. Um, anyway, so that was fun, and, and my part of that was to be representing Moral Bay and Bloom and um, putting my name on some of the the uh, things to um, the outings and dinners and such to see uh, to help raise money. So anyway, that was that was great fun, and I happened to sit next to the mirror when I it was all dark. It was hard to see when I sat down. <laughs> I was sitting next to the mirror. So that's it. Thank you. Yes, we have the older lady section at the back of the row. <laughs> um, and thank you. Yes, I did attend too. And and um, thank you to all the organizations um, that put this on. What a great event. I did not bid on things because I didn't want to get in trouble outbidding somebody. <laughs> um, I would remind you also that um, the event coming up that is being shared with Moral Bay and Bloom and... Um, other organizations, Saturday, April 27th, 2024, 830 to 11, City Park, Morro Bay Boulevard. You should all be seeing these around town. So hopefully you will be participating and attending a great event. Um, we are in the beginning of a conversation. That's as far as we've gotten with the celebration for the city's 60th that will be coming up. And I believe, um, which is in July. We had a huge celebration 10 years ago. Um, we had ha not had one for several years before that. It took a lot. And the celebration we had for the 50th was something every month. Um, this will be a most likely weekend event. And we're looking at potentially holding it after summer um, just because our recreation department staffing is at capacity during summer with all the youth programs. And a lot of our community is out of the area. So. Watch for those opportunities coming up, and we'll be outreaching to the community and service clubs for participation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, City Manager Kimball. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mayor, for uh, letting the audience know uh, where I am. And Mayor is absolutely correct. I am uh, attending the CGPIA's uh, um, first executive summit. CGPIA uh, stands for Joint Powers Insurance, California Joint Powers Insurance Authority. And uh, this authority um, is uh, the city's insurance carrier for our liability insurance, property insurance, and the workers' comp insurance. So um, there, there are over a hundred uh, members in this authority and this executive summit, um, since it's the first time, there's only 18 uh, city managers in, in this group. And so uh, we are have, we're having uh, very, um, uh, we, we, we have uh, some very um, closed, uh, closed um, conversations uh, regarding our, um, our, uh, our positions. And the goal is for me to, to gain the skills to, to be an effective leader and city manager. And next, I wanted to, to um, let a um, council, the audience, and the public know that um, the city manager's newsletter um, was out. Um, staff helped me get it out on Monday today. And it's uh, together, there are 26 pages. So it's a lot of information in there. I hope you'll enjoy that. Apolo 
cheese for getting uh, for have not get get my councilman get my city manager newsletter out prior to April. Um, I wanted to say that this has been a, a very good exercise. Uh, when I prepared a newsletter, um, it provided me a opportunity to truly appreciate the teamwork um, that city staff, city council, and have and the community have uh, put together. So I uh, want to give a shout, shout out to staff, to council, and the community. Um, and, and then moving on, I wanted to formally announce that Emily Conrad um, has stepped into the acting finance director role. We reclassified the uh, assistant city manager slash director of admin service position a few weeks ago into finance director and Emily Conrad formally um, being um, uh, appointed to the acting acting role. And Emily has been with the city for three years. Her um, um, previous position is finance manager. Um, for the last three years, Emily um, had uh, led the city to receive a uh, clean audits in a row in in three years in a row um, and then um, he she is really engaged um, for this uh, acting role at this point so hopefully he'll she'll keep her spirit high <laughs> and <laughs> with that I I wanted to um hand it off to um, Greg and then um, community development director and then um the police um Please commander for some updates. And I also want to thank council and great colleague and all my staff to hold down the fort while, while I'm away. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Qualick, would you like to lead off? Thank you, Mayor Wixom, and thank you, uh, City Manager Kimball. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce to the city council and to the public today two of our newest employees. We had two really heartbreaking um, losses in staff and engineering because we have such a small team working on so much and uh, everyone is looking for engineers Caltrans is looking for engineers all the cities in the area are looking for engineers we were able to fill those positions relatively quickly with the two ladies that I'm going to ask to step forward um, come on up to the podium and so I'll first introduce uh, Renee Brill Renee Brill is our new engineering tech uh, she has deep roots in the area um, her family has owned property here since the 60s. She lived here from the 70s through the 90s. They own two radio stations in the area, uh, an oldies and a country station uh, through the 70s and the, and the 90s. Um, her father was in the Air Force in Vietnam, and actually um, Renee will be his guardian on their honor flight to Washington, D.C. in May. Um, which is very exciting. Uh, Renee went to high school in Atascadero, but then went to LA, the big city, uh, for her schooling, sounds familiar, um, and went to USC for a degree in civil engineering. Um, but coming out of school, she did a lot of different things. She taught, she did appraising, she did some GIS stuff, um, but then ultimately worked for LA County Public Works for 16 years, and then decided to come back up uh, to her home and uh, has worked for the County of San Luis Obispo Public Works Department for five years. And we are just absolutely thrilled to have her. And Renee, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council council members. Thank you to the community here welcoming me with open arms. I am absolutely thrilled to be back to my home and to be able to work in this lovely city and to be a part of Public service has always been my lifelong um, passion. So being here and in a community, I am more than thrilled to have this opportunity to work with, with everybody here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. And Renee also lives uh, in Morro Bay. And next up, we have uh, Cynthia Cecil, who goes by Cindy. Uh, Cindy has around 40 years of experience in engineering. She's uh, She has her professional engineers license in structural and civil engineering. Uh, she has worked for San Diego Power and Gas. She's worked for San Luis Obispo County Public Works. She worked for San Diego County Public Works. She's um, had her, her own business as a consultant. Uh, and most recently, she's worked with RRM Consulting out of San Luis Obispo. Cindy actually has experience on some of the development projects that have occurred on this waterfront. And so 
She has experience in industrial, in marine, in residential, in commercial, and we are just so excited uh, to have her here. Uh, she also lives in Morro Bay. So, Cindy, if you'd like to say a couple words. Um, thank you, Greg. I'm just um, happy to have the opportunity to use my experience to help the city that I love and live in. That's it. Thank you. And that's the new public works hires. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Cindy. I had the pleasure of meeting Renee the other day when she was uh, onboarding, and Cindy and I have known each other for a long time, but I was surprised that she was our new engineer. Pleasantly surprised, so welcome and thank you. Uh, Mr. Cauldron? And we're actually going to skip Mr. Cauldron today because his, um, his hire will be here at the next meeting. Perfect. Thank you. We'll go to Tony. Commander? <laughs> uh, just want to uh, make everybody everybody aware we had our first uh, public um, our community meeting on I believe it was March 26th for Iron Man uh, Triathlon. Uh, we had some people show up to that and we were able to get some information out on that. We'll have another one at the end of this month and I and please excuse me, I forgot what the date is. Um, but it will be at the end of this month uh, leading into May, uh, where triathlon will be on the uh, <laughs> Uh, which is on a Sunday. So, um, aside from that, I do not have anything else that I can do. I don't know how to work it. I'm sorry. There it is. I have a loud voice, though, so hopefully that works. Oh, sorry, people on TV. Thank My you. apologies. Uh, aside from that, I don't believe I have anything else. Thank you. Thank you. I have the date is Friday, April 19th. So, that next right. meeting. Thank you. Mr. Qualick, anything else? Those are all the announcements. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to our presentation this evening. And we have a resolution declaring April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. The City of Morro Bay and the City Council, whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month calls attention to the fact that sexual assault, no, excuse me, fact that sexual and intimate partner violence is widespread and impacts every person in San Luis Obispo County. And whereas the marginalization of certain groups in society, including undocumented individuals, transgender individuals, and those living with disabilities increase their vulnerability to sexual violence. And whereas, although much progress has been made towards preventing and ending sexual violence, important work remains to be done. And whereas Lumina Alliance continues to provide a safe environment to those affected by sexual violence with crisis intervention, counseling, education, and emergency safe housing with the help of dedicated volunteers and professionals, and whereas Lumina Alliance provides services to 1,397 people in year 2022 to 2023, including answering 2,189 calls from the crisis line. And whereas Lumina Alliance provided 380 survivors with more than 4,800 sessions of therapy in 2022-23, and whereas Lumina Alliance provided evidence-based violence prevention education to 1,431 students in San Luis County in 22-23, whereas Lumina Alliance encourages the community to recognize her collective power to create a culture that supports survivors and works to create a community where everyone can live free of violence. Whereas Lumina Alliance is celebrating its 45th anniversary of serving survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence in San Luis County in 2024. Whereas the city of Morro Bay strongly supports the efforts of Lumina Alliance, however, how every segment of our community can work together to better address sexual violence and how to help survivors connect with services. And now there be it resolved, the Morro Bay City Council recognizes the important work done by sexual violence programs to hereby proclaim the month of April to be National Sexual Awareness Month. Thank you. And with that, I would like to invite Clementine Ellis up. Hello. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to Mayor Wixom and the City of Morro Bay um, City Council. Uh, my name is Clementine Ellis, and I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach at Lumina Alliance. 
Sexual Assault Awareness Month is an opportunity for us to reflect on the progress our community has made in supporting survivors of sexual violence, while also acknowledging the work ahead of us. Last year alone, Lumina Alliance volunteers and advocates answered 2,189 calls for help, emphasizing how prevalent sexual assault is in our culture and our community. This year, Lumina Alliance celebrates 45 years of survi serving survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence in San Luis Obispo County. Yet, our community's commitment to supporting survivors of sexual violence began long before that. The first rape crisis center in San Luis Obispo County began taking calls in 1976, establishing the first 24-hour crisis line for victims of sexual violence. Today, Lumina Alliance continues to host and staff this 24-hour crisis line, in addition to providing other vital services, such as transitional and emergency housing, therapy and counseling, and violence prevention programming. Unfortunately, this year also marks a difficult time for those dedicated to supporting survivors of sexual violence. Substantial cuts to the Victims of Crime Act or VOCA funding are on the horizon, significantly impacting all areas of direct client services, including a potential reduction in the hours of the crisis line for the first time in its 48 year history. April is dedicated to creating a community that not only condemns sexual violence of all kinds, but actively works to fight against it. Now more than ever, we need our community to take a stand against sexual assault and to speak out in support of the services that allow survivors to seek justice, heal, and thrive. Please visit luminaalliance.org slash VOCA to learn how you can help. Please remember, if you or anyone you know is experiencing sexual or intimate partner violence and needs help, please call 805-545-8888, our 24-hour crisis and information line, to speak to one of our confidential advocates. In closing, we are so grateful for this proclamation and the ongoing support of the Morro Bay City Council. Preventing and ending sexual violence is a lofty goal, but not an unachievable one. With the support of our local leaders and community members, we can work to build a community safe from all forms of sexual violence. On behalf of Lumina Alliance's board of directors, donors, staff, and volunteers, we thank all of you for taking action this month to create our vision of a safe, thriving, and equitable Slow County. Thank you. Thank you, Clementine. And I know you have an event this weekend because I know some of the people who are participating, if you wanted to share that event. Yes, we have our Lubina Nights event this weekend um, featuring Dancing with Our Stars on Friday and Saturday. Um, Saturday tickets are now sold out, but we still have a couple left for Friday. It's going to be a really fun, exciting event with food and dancing and great music. Um, so you can visit luminanights.org if you're interested in getting tickets or donating to one of our star dancers. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we are moving to public comment. I'm going to start with the speaker slips I've received so far. And after that, I'll be open to the general public. Uh, first up is going to be Linda, Linda Winters, followed by Adam and Lauren, and Aaron Oaks after that, please. I'm waiting. You're supposed to be in the picture. Here it is. Greetings, Mayor, Council folks, City staff, and the Chiefs. My name is Linda Winters, a 30 year resident in the same mobile home park on Main Street, right here in Green Bay. That picture that you see on the screen, and you know it's kind of faint, is the subject of my speech today. It's about this animal, her owning, and home. Last Saturday, April 6th, at approximately 9 a.m., my neighbor was walking his big Labradoodle and this dog outside together for the first time. There was some loud noise, and that spooked them, and they bolted south on Main Street. A wonderful person in a big pickup trip truck going southbound stopped, picked up the neighbor to retrieve the dogs. They got the Labradoodle, but the Husky ran frantically down Little Morro Creek Road by the bike park. Lots of folks helped to scour the area. They found nothing on Saturday or Sunday morning until big posters were posted by Taco Bell. Several folks had seen her back in the area where she started from. 
she was running by the freeway, unfortunately, and she managed to survive. Ultimately, she was reunited with the dog buddy, Cassius, and her new human paw. Why is this so amazing? She found her way back to the area from a little home she'd only been at for four days. She already knew the value of home, where she would be loved with that little home park on Main Street, right here in Main Bay. And by the way, her name is Pink, so that's why I'm wearing this. And she's only a year and a half old, thanks to all the folks that helped to find her. It's the same little home park that I call home for the past 30 years, where I fell in love with Moro Bay instantly, just like Pink. Thank you. Hello. Okay to start. We're Adam and Lauren Dragada. We uh, we're from Los Osos <clears throat> and we own a food truck catering business called Slow Dog. And we're here because we want to introduce ourselves to the council and um we would like to start a partnership with the city to um start a food truck program, but also to park in the park in the park our truck in the rock parking lot, and so and I, um, I have uh, fifteen years of experience. I was one of the original founders of SoCal MFA, which is the first food truck association in California. We worked. Um, with lots of cities over the years, I understand regulation and working together as one. Um, our real purpose was when we, we thought about working in Morro Bay was that we can do good for the city. I've raised a lot of money through a lot of different nonprofits. There's nothing more gratifying than being able to give back, especially if you're doing good for people. And um, we just want to be welcomed within the city and, and, and just that's about it. Share our good food with everyone and feed uh, the people. We feel like there's a need down in that area in the parking lot down by the rock. Um, there, it's far away from a lot of the restaurants and it's close to the beach. So people don't have to leave when the sunset comes or, you know, uh, take, take some food out to the beach and enjoy watching the waves and eat a really good hot dog or burger. So, um, we want to introduce ourselves and um we love the area we we have a family of three plus a dog four so <laughs> but yeah we really just want to introduce ourselves and um start a partnership with we we um we've uh, been permitted we we're permitted in slow county we have been um we have our business license yeah we have our business, our business license all additional, all insurance required for what a city would do. And we were approved by the fire marshal. Yeah. And we also want to offer our assistance with the city of just knowledge on how, like, we can help. Um, I know it's new. This is new for the city. Um, so our, our phone number is open, and we are here to help if, if the city would, wants some help with some of this stuff. I think that's Thank, it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ask Aaron if I may speak first. So uh, my name's not Aaron Osis, this is Barry Brannon. And uh, I'd like to uh, display the, uh, the new yard signs for the measure A24. As you probably know, uh, A24 is a citizen's uh, initiative. It'll be on the ballot in November. And what it does is, uh, there's a lot of misinterpretation, but the old PG&E property um, uh, has been 
the land use has been designated as visitor serving commercial. So this, this uh, measure only covers four pieces of property down by the, uh, the old PG&E property along the uh, Barcadero. And all it does is it requires that if the measure passes in November 4th, which I'm sure it will, based on the outreach we've had, that this requires to change the land use of that property down there will require the vote of the citizens. So all it does is it affirms what the Coastal Commission and the city agreed to do when they updated the land use plan, which was published about two years ago. So tonight I wanna say we have uh, numerous signs. We're glad to install them. Um, and if you see one somewhere and you wanna know more about it, there's a QR code up in the corner. Just snap your phone on there and it takes you right to our website. It'll tell you where you can get a sign. And uh, please, uh, you're, you're gonna see them all over the place because that's my job. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. My name is Aaron Oaks of Morro Bay. Uh, I want to uh, echo uh, Mr. Brandon's previous remarks uh, about A24. This is about preserving our land use and what was already designated by the City Council and the Coastal Commission. So this is not a retread. This is just merely reaffirming what the community wants, what the community has always wanted. Uh, and I'm a proud supporter of that. And I hope people vote for uh, A24 in November. So I haven't been around the city council for a while because I was just kind of taking a step back. And I've been trying to uh, work with the uh, Morro Bay Chamber of Commerce to make sure that they are on board with the rest of the community because there's there some controversy involving them with the uh, potentially merging with the San Luis Obispo Chamber of Commerce. Um, I received word just last week um, that the San Luis Obispo Chamber of Commerce is still interested in merging. Uh, and that's unfortunate because we've heard from the chamber just about over two months ago that there was nothing was gonna happen, that it was just a rumor, that you know it's all just hearsay. Well, I hate to break it to people, but it's not. And I've been waiting uh, to speak with the chamber, uh, specifically the president, Cherise Hansen, for the past two months, and I haven't heard back. So um, I think it's important to help restore the community trust with the chamber by getting them to really acknowledge what the facts are. If there is nothing going on with the merger, uh, let's talk about it. Let's put out a statement and let's be upfront with the community and the business community, because I've heard from... Uh, chamber members who are reaching out to to me, a non-chamber member, to try to facilitate a conversation about that. A and they feel that the uh, the chamber board of directors and the chamber president's not being forthcoming. And they feel the, the word that I've heard, unfortunately, time and time again, is gaslighting and saying, oh, we're going to take this before the board. We're going to talk about this. And it's going to take it under advisement. Well, you know, I want to make sure that uh, the Morro Bay Chamber of Commerce events, they're, they're part of the deal and um, uh, really clarifies to the community where they stand. Are they the Morro Bay Chamber of Commerce or are they the Vista Chamber of Commerce? Because that, that is a concern that a lot of people in the community have. It's a, it's a concern that I have and uh, I would love to hear from the chamber and, and not in the form of a press release I want to hear from them, I want to meet with them, and I want to make a deal. So I want to, I want to hear a statement from the chamber. And if I don't, well, it's going to time to defund the chamber. Thank you. I have one more speaker slip, Allison, and after that, public comment is open to everyone. Greetings to the mayor and to the chamber, council, police. My name is Ms. Soder, Allison Hope Soder, widow of Daniel Soder and mother of two daughters. I also have twins. Um, 
I'm local. I've lived here since 1998. I'm 37 years old. I went to Morro Bay High School in 2005. I am a licensed state certified massage therapist since 2007. I originated from Los Angeles, but I grew up in the area since the fourth grade, attended Baywood, Los Osos Middle School. Um, my parents are well known in the community, Victor Silva Palacios and Elizabeth Silva. Um, he used to work at Atascadero State Hospital. My mother used to work at CMC, CHC, excuse me, C, uh, uh, the, uh, the police, uh, the the jail. She was with the prison as a teacher. They now own their own uh, uh, marriage and family counseling license place in uh, San Luis Obispo. Anyways, um, I am representing the houseless in transition and the, uh, I call them the Care Bear Kids. I'm the squad commander, just kidding. Um, I'm extremely disappointed. I we had we had promises. I I've been houseless uh, off and on since my husband died in 2007, uh, 2020. Rest in peace. Um, he was working at Goofy Graphics. He's the man that used to do all your decals on your um, police cars all around town. He worked at Goofy Graphics. Gary is my great grandfather um, in law, and. Uh, we were told after being kicked out of the creek uh, that the houses that were made on the 41 were to be for the houseless. And I just think that this city needs to do better. We are an example to people who are visiting. This is the happiest place in the US according to Oprah. Well, I, 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 I'm concerned because I believe that we must do more we must do more. If there, if you are not part of the solution, fellow council people, you're perpetuating the problem. How are we supposed to, what we need is a helping hand up, not just a hand out. I'm sorry, but these are people, human beings, elderly, people with disabilities, people. We are all people here in this land. And I am so sick of the audacity of the police station to 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 bang on the door. Or Twenty seconds, twenty seconds. To bang on the door of the Albertsons bathroom when my friend has a concussion is just trying to get dressed real quick, change in the bathroom, surrounded. Uh, I mean, I, I just why should my friend have to be sleeping on the sidewalk? And 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 I'm sorry, believe me, but I've been trying to get into your place since for twelve years. I am a survivor of DV, and we refuse to be victims of criminal abuse. Thank you very much. Do something. Do better. Those are integrity. We must do better. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment is open to everyone. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, and staff. Terry Simons, Moore Bay. Uh, as is my custom, it's kind of a shotgun approach of all the things that are not on the agenda. First of all, let me say uh, I'm excited about the two new engineering people that we've added to the staff. I know I don't know the one lady, but I do know Cindy. I've known her for a long time, and I think she's going to fill a very, very needed niche in the department, not so much because of her pure civil engineering background, but because of her hybrid background in building and engineering. And a lot of public works and engineering does involve building projects and building-related projects. I've known her personally for several years, and... I know the firms that she's worked for and seen the work that she's done, and I think, boy, did we score. I do want to reiterate how great it is that we're hiring people that live in Morro Bay. I can't emphasize how important that is, both to the benefit of the city and to the benefit of the community. So thank you very much. Um, next item. I, too, attended the Vistra Dog and Pony Show. And as is my custom, I sat quietly, not as not what I do at council, but I sat quietly and listened. And I was quite surprised to see what I can only describe as a bait and switch program going on. It would appear, and this is one of the criticisms that has come along with the whole lithium battery storage technology, that Vistra and its uh, entry into the market is discovering that the technology is changing. And so they have made a very radical change in what they're now proposing to do as a quote unquote alternative versus what they actually applied for in their initial presentation and the primary focus of the environmental impact report. I'm concerned because, well, I would say 90% of the environmental impact report would transfer 
from their original proposal to their new proposal, I think there is a significant deficit of discussion in the EIR over the uh, modified changes, the new type of changes. They're eliminating the building and bringing in a bunch of modular units, which I think has both pluses and minuses. You know my technique. I'm basically a pragmatist. I can see both sides. <coughs> Excuse me, I spent way too much time in the sun today here in Morro Bay. It was beautiful. Um, so I would hope that uh, there will be a hefty response to the draft EIR and that I don't know quite what your process will be. Normally, you would not hear that until it came forward with the project, but hopefully this council can give the uh, EIR preparers a heads up that maybe there are some deficits in the EIR that they might want to look at. And I had one more point. Oh, yes. Um, I think it... Um, uh, there's a saying that uh, history repeats it, doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And I'm afraid that I'm hearing a rhyme in the support for the yoga center. I appreciate the efforts of those people, but that building has to go. It's a part of a very, very significant project for the city. And to, I would hope that in the lease agreement, I know I'm running over. Thank you, Terrell. I would hope that in the lease agreement, there was no misrepresentation and or indication that they could stay in that building. Thank, Thank you. you, Terry. Anyone else for public comment? Good evening, Madam Mayor and respected members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Alex Beatty. I've been fortunate to be a resident of Morro Bay for the last 25 years. And what I want to address you tonight is a project that is probably one of the more important ones that have come in the 25 years. And based on what some of our previous speakers have said, I think you know what I'm talking about. It's batteries energy storage project cited for an area in Morro Bay, which the city citizens of Morro Bay has said should be visitor serving. And uh, this designation was made with the aim of protecting the coastal nature of our city. And in addition, trying to protect our fishing industry. The proposed project does not do that. It threatens these goals. The project that the applicant submitted actually requires an exemption to our local coastal plan, which everybody's film was actually approved by a fairly wide majority. And surprisingly, just recently, the California Coastal Commission says it's a good plan. Uh, there are cases when you want to give an exemption. For instance, a project that produces a product that's so valuable and it can only be produced in one way, we're going to give an exemption. This project does not qualify. You can and you have storage, stored energy in many different ways many different sites. Unfortunately, the applicant only investigated one site. Uh, the one thing that an energy storage project does need is a good, reliable source of a lot of energy. When I looked through their energy EIR, they did not identify their source and it could be important issue. Uh, now the applicant is a Fortune 500 company. It has allegiance to its stockholders, not the citizens and visitors. I think we forget our visitors in Morro Bay also, the visitors in Morro Bay. This council, I believe, owes its allegiance and diligence to the citizens of, of Morro Bay. Sorry. In closing, I request that the city require the applicant to resubmit its EIR 
and it includes an analysis of other sites and lets folks know where it's getting its energy from. And uh, thank you for your time and thank you. good night. Betty Winholtz, uh, just to follow up on the last two points uh, regarding um, the DEIR, is it, and, and I guess I'm asking publicly so I can hear from the city attorney, is it legal to change technology or systems delivery in the middle of an EIR? Does it not have to come back as the previous speaker just said, or is there some kind of exception um, through CEQA where you can change that in the middle of your document or you presenting your, your public comments from the public. So I would like that clarified, please. Let's talk about priorities. Um, I know oftentimes, and some of you have cited this, that when looking at, let's call them administrative positions, like for instance, political appointments, which I believe city council would be considered political. Uh, people often cite small business experience. Personally, I like small businesses. Uh, anytime I'm thinking about how to solve economic issues on a large scale, one of the things that I often contemplate is the idea of preserving the entrepreneurial spirit, whether or not said entrepreneurial spirit is in fact necessary, I have not decided yet. But it's interesting to consider the idea that when you're running a business, the point of a business, well, not to make it sound callous, is in fact to make yourself money. Um, if you were going to be doing it for the sake of a community, you would probably do something like a nonprofit. Um, however, <laughs> We are citizens. This is our home. We are not employees. Uh, that is not how a city should be run. I'm not sure the same priorities would apply. Uh, for instance, things like the homeless. Um, if we're trying to attract tourism, which is the basis for our economy, then unequivocally getting rid of the homeless people is a good thing. We want to get rid of the homeless people because they make our city look bad. Treating them nicely, treating them like human beings, making ourselves seem more moral does not make money. Another example being the wind farm and the battery energy storage site, which to my understanding, Lithium ion batteries and storage technologies are really only good for one thing, that being portability. The energy density is much higher than a lot of other materials. Uh, however, the upfront costs are going to be a lot. No, the upfront costs are going to be higher. Apologies, one moment. Sorry, the long-term costs are going to be more than, for instance, large-scale nickel-iron batteries or tidal-based power, or we have a bunch of hills. During the day, you can pipe water up a hill and then run it down at night when you need the extra power. Um, there's a lot of options like that. For instance, the same money that could be going into building you know, a huge scale industrial wind farm that people are not happy about could be going towards putting solar panels on people's roofs. Just things like that. And there's a lot of options. However, they're not as flashy. They don't look as good. And, you know, they might cost a little bit more upfront. But in the long term, they're really going to pay off. Anyone else for public comment? AGP. Hi, Mayor Wixom. We have no raised hands in the queue right now. Thank you very much. With that, I'll close public comment and bring it back to council. Um, Mr. Cauldron, or do you want to punt that question on the change in technology and delivery for the draft EIR? Uh, sure, thank you. Mayor and members of council, I'm happy to address the question. Um, in terms of changing technology is one of the things that we've heard through 
the public presentations that Vistra has uh, given in their uh, workshops, and then the information that was submitted as part of the um, safety uh, plan offsite consequences analysis uh, shows a container based battery array as opposed to batteries stored within buildings. Um, and uh, just want to highlight that there is an alternative uh, in the EIR that evaluates the container um, component as well as alternatives that value uh, smaller scale projects or reduced number of batteries. Um, and those are things that uh, the EIR, even though there's a, a change, uh, what the EIR does is it considers those alternatives. And to the extent that um, those alternatives do not have greater environmental uh, effects than what the proposed project is, um, that they that the existing EIR analysis is then determined to be sufficient through through the process. So there may be a need for some, uh, when the project is going through public hearings, the Planning Commission and City Council, uh, we have to staff has to analyze that and and present to the City Council that the EIR is adequate, that it covers all the potential impacts associated with the project and mitigates those to less than significant levels if possible. So that that's our job as staff to make sure that you have all the information that reflects what project is being proposed. Uh, preliminarily in this case, in, in terms of our review, it, it appears that the EIR is adequate, but uh, remains to be seen, you know, through the process and we'll be sure to, you know, uh, the, the, the staff and community development, our consultants uh, will be e evaluating the, the actual project uh, in the future and making sure that the EIR covers all of the potential impacts. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cauldron. Um, one other question and just is there any dates set yet for uh, workshops and public meetings, or are those still in the works? There are uh, two dates that I'd be happy to share with the public. One is May 7th at the Planning Commission. Um, so uh, members of the public will have an opportunity to make their comments in front of the Planning Commission on May 7th at their regularly scheduled meetings. So that might be a benefit if you don't want to uh, send an email into the city if you uh, prefer to come to a meeting and, and communicate verbally. Um, also, be good uh, for folks to hear what their neighbors are saying about the project. You know, it's uh, uh, sometimes it's challenging to know like where every you know what those ideas are, what those concerns are, and these open forums uh, provide an opportunity for you to hear what everybody's comments are. Um, so. That there won't be any decisions made at that meeting. It's just an opportunity for a, another venue for the public to be able to make their comments on the EIR. Uh, the EIR consultants and staff will be there, so we'll be taking notes of all the comments made, and all of those comments and questions get responded to in the final EIR. Thank you. And you said there was another date, or is that? Uh, and then uh, we are planning right now a uh, workshop on the power plant master plan, uh, which the general plan identifies as a prerequisite for any use to be developed on the power plant property. Uh, and so uh, our team wants to engage the public, citizens of Morro Bay, uh, business owners, property owners in Morro Bay on what the future of the power plant should be, You know, even regardless of what's proposed today. Uh, we're really interested in uh, people's ideas. And this master plan is a little bit like um, more detailed level of planning that occurs in the general plan. So we know what the general plan says right now about land uses. Uh, the master plan will allow us to go a, a step deeper and think about infrastructure and other kinds of things that are necessary for the property to be developed uh, based on the vision of the community. Thank you. And those dates when they're confirmed will be posted on the city website, correct? They will be. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, with that, we will open public comment on the consent agenda. I have no speaker slips, so please comments on items 7A through 7E. AGP, do we have anyone in the queue? Hi, Mayor Wixom. We have no raised hands in the queue. Thank you very much. With that, I will close public comment on the consent agenda and bring it back to council. Does anyone wish to pull any items? To my left, to my right. I would ask for a motion. 
I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Thank you. And we'll do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Moving on to our business item, 9A. And I believe this is going to be you, Mr. Qualick. Thank you, Mayor. So. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sure. So this item is the closeout of the FBV contract that stands for Felons Black and Veach, which is the joint venture um, between Felons and Black and Veach to design and build the new treatment plant. So this project has been around for several years. It started in 2018 when the state told us that we could no longer use the discharge waiver for our old treatment plant and we need to, to enhance our level of wastewater treatment and um, I will not go through the full history, but um, several years and a few dollars later, we do now have a fully built out treatment plant that provides advanced purified water treatment that will help us with our recycled water project that is is upcoming. So uh, this is a this is a milestone moment for us to close out this contract. Uh, we are we are complete completely done with the plant. And so um, we have a presentation from project manager from Corolla, Mr. Anthony Simo, who is going to go through the final settlement deal. Um, and the city council will have the opportunity to uh, vote, vote on that deal to close this contract with FBV. So Anthony, please. Thanks, Greg. Uh, good evening, honorable mayor and city council. Um, Again, my name is Anthony Simo with Pro Engineers. I'm a project manager for the water reclamation facility. I've been working on the project for several years and um, have been involved in this closeout negotiations with Felong Black and Beach as well as um, with the city as well as Corolla. So with that being said, um, uh, where do I point this? Which way? Is it, is it on? Okay, project status. So uh, the project status of where the project is today, um, FBV, again, Feelong Black and Beach, is in the final stages of the project closeout uh, activities, meaning they have submitted all of their potential change orders, which are P or PCOs, is what I'm gonna say from here on out. And the punch list items are complete at the plant. The city issued a notice of substantial completion on January 24th, 2024, and that uh, was uh, released the final retention amount of 212,000. And that retention amount was solely tied to the punch list items. So there are a few project closeout considerations in this whole negotiation process with FBV. So as of today, FBV's current guaranteed maximum price for their contract is $78.4 million. The city's budget for this project is $79.1 million. So of those PCOs that were submitted, there are six in total. And on this table, the green shows that PCOs that Corolla found to have merit, and the other two were PCOs that Corolla and FBV could not come to a resolution on. However, there was lots of discussion and back and forth on those. And I'm, I'm going to go in each go in detail on each one. So as you can see, the PCOs that we found to have merit were a total of approximately $425,000. And the total PCOs for PCOs 23 and 138 was around $2 million for a grand total of all six to 2.4 million. So the next six slides are gonna go through each one of these PCOs in detail. The PCO 122 was a delay claim by FBV for uh, the initial seeding of the plant, the initial seed sludge biology at the WERF when it was initially seeded to start commissioning and startup was weakened due to a lack of food and development for the biology of the wastewater. And on October 11th, there was a poor, it was a slug of poor water quality wastewater that was sent from the city's existing plant that essentially killed all of the biology, therefore requiring a reseeding of the plant. 
this PCO was found to have merit. The site has various several V ditches around the, the the hillside drainage, and where the fence crosses over the V ditches, there is a gap in the fence, and the city requested that that gap be covered with uh, fencing. And this was added, and this PCO was found to have merit. In PCO one thirty one, as we all know, the twenty twenty two twenty twenty three rainy season pulled us out of our drought, but it was a significant rainy season, and that level of effort to maintain the Project Stormwater Pollution Prevention Measures, or the best the best management practices measures, BMPs, um, was a significant amount of effort because the contractor had to continue, the rain was so hard, the contractor had to continue to replace them and replace them, which was a, a much higher level of effort than initially anticipated. So this PCO was found to have merit. Um, and the last PCO that was found to have merit was the SRF Billings and Administration. Um, the contractor, in order to uh, fall within the requirements of the SRF construction loan, had to perform a significant amount of administrative effort to collate all of the task codes uh, in their billings with respect to 16 specific SRF items or 16 specific bid items. So with that, uh, this, this uh, PCO is found to have merit uh, due in part to FBV doing a lot of work in order to facilitate um, a very streamlined SRF reimbursement strategy. So the next two PCOs are the PCOs that don't have, that we could not come to a resolution on with FBV. So uh, there was a delay for uh, Department of Drinking Water, also known as DDW, for the UV AOP, which is ultraviolet advanced oxidation process, challenge test uh, delay. So what this is that the Department of DDW after the plant was in a um, was con was almost commissioned, the Department of DDW required additional testing for the UVAOP system in two processes or two phases, and this testing was outside of the initial permit requirements and required extensive testing, reporting, meetings, coordination, uh, and analyses from FBV. And FBV's ultimate claim for this was that it it was extended overhead, requiring them to stay on site for an extended period of time. As mentioned, there was no resolution on this between FBV and Corolla. The, la the, the last PCO was PCO 138 for the V-Ditch failures, repairs, and redesign and reconstruction for the January 9th storm event, the very significant storm event. Um, there was significant erosion and failure, structural failures of the V ditches at the wharf site. And FBV also made design improvements as well as reconstructed those V ditches that failed or that uh, were destroyed. And they also rehydroceded the hillside in order to and install a temporary irrigation system to make sure that that hydroceding was established to prevent further erosion. So with that, Again, the status of PCOs 123 and 138, we provided significant comments, coordination, discussion with FPV, trying to derive the costs out of those that had merit, and FPV would not accept those terms and stated that these, uh, that both of these PCOs uh, were due full um, for a full cost. Um, so again, significant gap remained between the city's position on the basis of merit and FBVs. So with that, when you um, in this project or in projects, um, let's just take a step back and again reiterate the the current the situation. The current GMP contract amount for the project seventy eight point four million. For those PCOs that have merit, that adds four hundred thousand dollars for a that would increase the GMP to seventy eight point eight million. For the PCOs 123 and 138, if we also include those, that brings the piece, the total contract amount to 80.8 million, which is above the city's budgeted amount of 79.1 million. So as you can see in this graphic, that would bring the city over budget by $1.7 million. So since there was un there was no resolution between those PCOs between the city between Corolla the city and FBV, the next step would be to go to some type of mediation process, and that mediation process would hopefully break develop a resolution. However, that is a significant cost in legal expenses, consultant expenses, and time for everybody. So with that, we looked at three scenarios that we could potentially that could potentially 
uh, be a result of mediation. And those three scenarios are here. We have a high scenario, a medium scenario, and a low scenario. And of these, the high scenario is a full PCO cost of 2.4 million. A medium scenario is to fully remove PCO 138, reduction of $670,000, and a low scenario by reducing all PCOs by 50%. Now, the thing is, with those three scenarios, each one will bring the, the total contract amount over the city's budget. As you can see on the far right, the new GMP for the contract, all three scenarios are over the city's budget of $79.1 million. So with that assessment, those, uh, the likelihood of those scenarios resulting out of mediation is our assessment that the high, the high scenario most likely would not happen. We found many gaps in the change orders, the PCOs, and we don't think the high scenario left lots of room to negotiate and to bring the cost down, which leads to the medium scenario. It is likely that that medium scenario could have reduced the cost to five to $700,000. And that, but again, as I mentioned, that's still above the city's budget. And the low scenario is the least likely everyone going to mediation and FBV reducing their costs by a total of 50%. And again, none of these scenarios resulted in favorable, favorable outcomes to the city. So there was an offer that what FBV's initial offer was, what if the contract amount was increased to 79.1 million and the contract is full, completely fulfilled and all PCOs are, I want to say the word dissolved, all PCOs are, um, just accepted for the initial contract amount of 79.1 million dollars and all PCOs that are outstanding are no longer outstanding and pretty much removed from the project. So with that, the city and FBV and Corolla negotiated to a value of 79.0 million dollars. And as I mentioned, given the 79.1 million dollar city con city budget amount, that dollar amount falls below below the city's budget. So with that, the project management team, Corolla, and FBV agreed that this final PCO amount of $79 million um, fully compensates FBV for all services. So that's what I was saying where the PCOs outstanding, we're saying that this $79.0 million fully compensates for all of those services encompassed in those PCOs and for the full contract amount or for the full scope of services. So with this, it is our recommendation that the, um, the city accept the offer in, for the closeout settlement at 79.0 million for the full contract amount and that the revised final GMP, that and revise the final contract GMP to an amount of $79 million through amendment number 10 to FBV's contract. Now with that said, there's no fiscal impact to the current WARF program budget. As I mentioned, it falls below the budget of $79.1 million. And given the city's current funding sources, the current funding sources are appropriate to cover that $79.0 million amount. So with that, I would like to open up the floor for questions. And I'll just add here that the action for the city council, the recommended action from staff is to approve amendment 10 uh, to the FBV contracts, and that, that would be the closeout action. Thank you very much. Um, we've seen this presentation at closed sessions, so council has been brought up to speed just for the sake of the general public. Um, and uh, Mr. Qualick and his team, along with Carrillo, and I see Damaris Hansen here, and, and everyone has participated too work towards closure and the councils before us. So to get to this point um, is a relief. Having to pay anything extra is hard for us. Uh, Council Member Landrum and myself on the subcommittee have been fighting all the way along as has the rest of this council. So um, just, just a FYI. <laughs> With that, I will go to questions. My left, any questions? Nope, nope. To my right, any questions? No, thank you. I'm going to open public comment. Don't go far. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm going to open public comment. Thank you. And I have one speaker slip um, from Terry Simons. Good evening once again, Madam Mayor, Council, and staff. Terry Simons, Morrow Bay. 
Um, I was the owner and operator of a small public works contracting business in the 80s. We did approximately $10 million a year, which is about $100 million a year now. So I'm not unfamiliar with this process. I will say that my experience uh, leads me to conclude that uh, this is a very good deal for the contractor, and I can see that they would be enthusiastic to accept it. Um, I'm not going to put a value judgment on the work. I have infinite confidence in our public works director's ability to assess the viability of this proposal, and if he's in favor of it, I'm in favor of it. I would like to point out that the PCL 123, um, which is not which is being challenged and it's not being paid, called for a hundred one million three hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars of testing on the quality of the water being generated by the facility. I would like to get or have made to the, available to the public the qu water quality results of that because I continue to take the position that that water quality should be at such a fine grade. This was something that we paid extra for. It was recommended by the manufacturer that we would have a state-of-the-art facility that would, would basically create potable water when we were done. I'd like to know what the state thought about it and what the quality of the water that's being dumped in the ocean right now really is in terms of its direct inject potential. Um, you know, I'm a fan of direct injection. I, before we get too far down the road of our whole um, undergrounding of this water, and I realize a lot of the reason to underground the water is simply to store it, but I think that mechanically that's not necessary. I think that we can balance the reinjection with the demand, blend it with state water, and make this work without having to go through the ardors of building a huge injection facility to pollute the groundwater or to, to add water to a polluted groundwater and then have to treat it and retreat it and then pump it back up into storage. So I would really, really like to know what the quality of the water is that's coming out of the plant right now and what does it take and compare the cost of that because at that, at that location, it could be easily re-injected into, into our main supply system if it meets the state requirements. And those requirements changed as of January this year. It's now an allowed use, an allowed facility. Um, I'm afraid we're headed down a road with this um, injection well program that is gonna ultimately be as costly and cost overrun prone as we've experienced in the first two phases of this. If you look at our original budgets and what these first two phases have cost, we're running over 20% cost overrun. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment is open on this item. Evening, Billy Winholtz again. Um, I, I let me compliment you having brought this down, kept it within the most recent high bid that this plant was supposed to cost. So thank you for that. But I, I do want to remind us and the public that all parties signed a contract with agreements to indemnify the city as harmless. And yet here, beyond, beyond blue, those guys are asking us to pay for acts of God, to pay for a change in how um, the con the um, our loan people wanted us to do contracts. I think that's just so unfair. So I would like that if at some point some other agency asks the city of Morrow Bay for a recommendation on this company that you don't give them one that's not bad. Because I think we've had an awful time with Fianc and Black and Veatch. And that's so unfair to this community and to any other community they may end up working for. And I'm not sure how the Corolla fits into all of that, but um, thank you for bringing that, the change orders down. Anyone else for public comment on this item? AGP, is there anyone in the queue? Hi, Mayor Wixom. There are no raised hands in the queue right now. Thank you very much. With that, I'll close public comment and bring it back to council. Um, can we have some short answer on the water quality results? 
Are those public available? Thank you, Mayor Wixom. So we do have recent challenge test results. Uh, we did a challenge test where we actually spiked the water with new chemicals. We introduced chemicals and make sure that the system takes that out. And uh, we did pass that test. We can test the water quality really whenever we'd like. And so if, um, if, if Mr. Simons is interested in seeing some of that data, he can reach out to myself and, and Damaris. Um, and we, we can make that information public if the council wished. Uh, I just think the upkeep of that would, you know, be a bit of an administrative burden. Thank you for that. And also, um, the the injection wells we've recently determined are mandated. We have. That's true. And um, we have had this suggestion come up a few times. And I would just uh, remind the, the the council and and others that. Um, direct potable reuse is certainly in the future, and that that is a, a you know it, it is a doable thing. Um, but it's very new, and the permitting and regulations are not all there yet. We've had our own experiences in, in Morro Bay with how the plant was configured, where we were helping the regulators set the regulations, and that is a very time-consuming um, process because the regulations aren't just there. We have to help the regulators come up with them. And so for that reason, you have, um, you know, City of LA or San Francisco uh, looking into this technology. Um, and so for the City of Morro Bay to change project in the middle when we have a very aggressive deadline set to us uh, in our in our loan agreements, it, it just, um, you know, in the opinion of staff, that that change doesn't make sense. Thank you for that clarification. Any questions for Carrillo or for Mr. Qualick? I have um, one thing I, I'm not sure I understand with the V-ditch. Well, I just want to clarify it. We've tested it since it's been repaired and it's working and we know it's not going to fail. And I'll and thank you for the question, Council Member Landrum. I'll ask Damaris Hansen, our utilities division manager, to answer that since our office is just a few feet away from the V-ditches. <laughs> Um, yes, they have been repaired and it has rained since and they do work. Okay, thank you. And then um, I'm wondering, I, this is something I'd forgotten to ask earlier. Um, and I never really, I'm not really sure, maybe I forgot, but what was the outcome of the monument sign? Of the responsibility for that? Thank you for the question, Council Member Landrum. So we did remove that monument sign in a inexpensive manner with our own staff and um Damaris and her team have have put up uh I think window clings on the on the um on the outside of the building and so we do have some signage our ultimate goal is to have some wayfinding signage closer to Teresa Road um it's a bit of a complicated situation because it's all privately owned um if you're asking the responsibility for the um the erection of the the original monument sign itself, I'm jogging my memory here. I believe the city ate that, and I think it was around twenty four thousand dollars. Okay, I was just wondering if maybe there's some way that Corolla would want to share in that cost, and um, because it's not just the the twenty four thousand, it's also the cost to remove it and and to replace it too, and. It, it's a little murky as to whose responsibility that is. And and we did ask Corolla to share in that cost, and they declined. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Seeing none, I will um, make a motion to approve amendment number 10 and ask for a second. I second. Thank you. And we'll do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Qualick, 9B. Thank you, Mayor Wixom. Again, uh, the other major contract that is part of the WARF program was the conveyance pipelines uh, to get water to, um, excuse me, to get wastewater up to the plant from the area of the old plant and to bring back uh, the discharge and also a recycled water line. And uh, that was around three and a half miles through really the center of town. And it was a very painful project for the city, as everyone knows here. When I started uh, for the city of Morbay almost three years ago, Quintana Road was already closed. 
and it was closed for much longer than any, any of us wanted. The bike path was closed for a very long time. Um, the project is, is now complete with the exception of one remaining item, uh, which is this brine line capacity issue. Uh, and I believe there may be some questions about that, but um, uh, here, here we have a settlement agreement that uh, we negotiated and the, the city attorney's office uh, played a major role in negotiating. Uh, this was actually originally negotiated in, in May and June of 2023. And um, right when we were about to put everything to council uh, in, in June of 2023, Anvil walked away from the deal. And um, then that sat idle for quite some time. And uh, again, we brought this back this spring and it, you know, Anvil is okay uh, re resurrecting that deal. And we think it's a, it's a good deal. Um, Anthony will go into the details of that in his presentation now, and then we'll take questions after. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Hello again. Uh, so this presentation is regarding the conveyance facilities closeout. Uh, for the water reclamation facility program, this is uh, for the closeout of Anvil Builders. Um, they were the contractor for the uh, uh, the conveyance facilities. So, uh, just some background. Uh, just as Greg uh, outlined, the city issued a notice of substantial completion in April of 2023, and after they noticed substantial completion. They proceeded to engage in the final closeout terms, which again was in the spring of 2023. Uh, and while we were negotiating the final closeout terms, the city or Anvil was completing the punch list closeout items. So the biggest thing was that through that negotiation, Anvil's largest claim was for an acceleration claim uh, to uh, an acceleration claim to work pretty much work more and faster. So with that, um, the city offered terms for the agreement uh, for the final settlement, and Anvil agreed to those terms. However, as Greg mentioned, in June of 2023, Anvil did not sign those terms. So let's reset and go through the settlement process that we discussed back a, about a year ago. The outstanding change orders were uh, that for the closeout were approximately $4.2 million in uh, 35 change orders. Corolla reviewed these with the city, and of those 35, 20 had merit for a total amount of $1.62 million. And this was included in Amendment 8 to Anvil um, in May 2020, May 24th, 2023 council meeting. So with that $2.6 million remaining, the city offered $780,000 for the remaining PCOs that had merit for a total closeout of 2.4 with respect to the 4.2. Anvil's counteroffer was 980. So we, we considered some options between the offer and the counteroffer. So again, similar to the FBV, there was, uh, you know, we have two options and we were having a hard time coming to resolution. And for these contracts in those situations, Typically, the next step is a mediation. Is mediation, so the option one was to reject Anvil's offer. If that was the case, it posed a high risk to the city because then, if mediation was the next step, then Anvil's new goal was uh, for litigation to get the full remaining two point six million dollars rather than simply nine hundred eighty. And with that, the total consultant costs, legal fees, time for city time, all that would greatly outweigh the $200,000 difference between the two options. Option two would be to accept Anvil's offer. However, the majority of the offer focused on the acceleration of work that Anvil performed and uh, that remaining $200,000, um, uh, again, was m mostly focused on acceleration uh, and extended overhead. So with that, the goal, the option three was to split the difference to come to a resolution. So with this, the city op offered um, op option three for an $880,000 closeout. And separate of that $880,000, the city would retain $200,000, which they are currently retaining today, and apply if necessary to additional work on the city's existing ocean outfall pipeline. 
Anvil accepted these terms, but as stated in June 2023, did, did not, they did not sign the amendment, and that is because they interpreted language in the closeout document to present to them future risks and costs. So with that, through about a year, Anvil has reconsidered the closeout document and has already signed the closeout offer, or they're ready to sign. They've already agreed to, sorry. The city to pay 880000 and continue to retain $200,000, again, separate of the 880. So with that, there are some other considerations. The outfall pipeline hydraulics is still not resolved. The design engineer, waterworks engineers, contends that the hydraulic constraints are not construction related. However, there are other analyses that suggest that construction is not the root cause and this is going to take some additional time to resolve based on to resolve looking into the construction and out and design of the outfall. So with that, the settlement agreement language was drafted that the settlement can proceed absent the final resolution to the outfall hydraulics. And the city will re retain that $200,000 until it is resolved. So the recommendation is to finalize the settlement with option with 20 with the 2023 option three of $880,000 in the city to retain the $200,000 um, until the outfall hydraulic resolution is confirmed. Um, so again, I will like to open the floor to questions. Thank you. Yep. Any, Mr. Qualick, anything else to add? Thank you. I would just share again that this has been a long, hard fought battle by the council and um, the city team, the city attorney and everyone to get to this point. And um, I know our concern, the council's concern has been about the long-term uh, potential maintenance of the fix for the brine line. So therefore that's part of the reason for the retention at this point. So questions from council, questions? I will, thank you. I will go to public comment. I have a speaker slip from Terry. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Terry Simons, Council and staff. Um, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. If this settlement makes sense to our planning community or our public works director, I'm good with it. I would like to point out that one of my concerns is that this is the this project is right in the heart of my 40 year expertise. I spent a lot of time because I had a lot of time um, watching this project evolve. And I can say categorically and would so if called as an expert witness when this goes to trial, if it goes to trial, that it's probably one of the worst managed public works projects of this type I have ever seen in my life. And I've seen and done a lot of them. Having said all of that, I think Anvil would be very well advised to take this settlement and to move on and it appears that they recognize that also. As to the retention of $200,000 over the outfall hydraulics, my suspicion, and again, it's just a suspicion because I don't have the inside information, is that it's my understanding that we're currently sending all of the product water from the plant to the ocean outfall. Well, that's not what the outfall, in my opinion, was to, the outfall line, the brine line was designed to handle. It was designed to handle just simply the brine output, not the entire production of the plant. I could be wrong, just guessing. If there are hydraulic issues that need to be resolved, my first recommendation would be that you throttle back the amount of uh, effluent from the plant that's being forced through that line so that you can get a true assessment of what the real brine line capacity and hydrodynamics are before you jump to the conclusion that it's not working because I think it's being overtaxed right now. Again, I could be wrong. Um, other than that, let's get this behind us, people. We've still got the whole water final phase to resolve and learn our lessons. And one of the lessons that I've learned from this particular project is you do not want to have the design engineer and their affiliates who design a project also be the supervising field representatives of the community. That's such a bad idea. And I think that a lot of the technical problems and issues that occurred came from a lack of coordination 
uh, and a kind of a cover your behind approach between the contractor and the inspector because the inspector was also with the guys who designed it. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Betty Winholtz, Mr. Uh, Terry Simons couldn't have said it any better. Uh, just like uh, Fionc Black and Beach, I hope if anyone asks you about Anvil that you give them the worst F grade that you can give them. Um, I My only concern, and again, thank you for bringing it down. Thank you for closing it out. Thank you for retaining some money for the brine. However, my only concern is, have we really retained enough? Should it actually be more than $200,000? And so um, regarding his final comments, um, you know, the council was told seven years ago when this first started six years ago, don't have three different companies who will argue against each other and blame each other. So those of you who were on council back and then, so hope you've learned your lessons as well. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment on this item? AGP? Hi, Mayor Wixon. There are no raised hands in the queue. Thank you very much. With that, I will close public comment and bring it back to council. Um, would you like to address anything with the outfall um, brine line affluent levels? Thank you, Mayor Wixom. Just a comment. I don't know how you knew that I wanted to, but I did. Just uh, um, yes, I, I would. <laughs> So just one point I want to make so that the community understands um, a little bit more about the brine line issue. I don't want to go into detail on it unless the council would like us to, but um, th this is not a sort of ongoing defect that staff is dealing with uh, in terms of capacity. It is, It really only occurs during extreme peak flows. And the only time that it's occurred uh, was when we had our storm uh, on January 9th, 2023, and the um, intake for pump station A uh, was mistakenly not covered, and which meant there was a gaping hole in the system in the, in the middle of the flooded area. And the, the whole system was taking in basically the flood. And so that was an extreme event that wouldn't occur now because um, that gaping hole isn't there anymore and it's all covered. Could it happen again in the future? Possibly, depending on um, the development that happens in the city and what happens with these storms, whether they get increasingly severe. But even in a severe storm now, it's not something that's problematic for the city. That said, the city paid for 8.1 million gallons a day at peak flow capacity, and we don't have that. And so that is an ongoing issue, and um, that is something that we want to remedy. And so, you know, if Anvil is seen to be at fault, then yes, we would dip into that two hundred thousand dollars of retention, um, and and remedy that. Now, it's possible that Waterworks is also at fault, or maybe some other parties. And the city is doing uh, an evaluation um, with Corolo and also our own independent evaluation to determine what exactly is going on there. I, I would just like to also add a clarification on the brine lines use. Um, the product water is not going out in the brine, brine line. It's treated wastewater is going to the ocean outfall. The product water is, is through the system, the city's advanced water purification system, and that would go through a recycled water system. So anything going in the brine line is simply treated wastewater. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, and thank you for helping us negotiate these contracts down. Uh, any questions or comments? And I would, Mayor, I would, just a real quick comment. Um, I just want to, um, I want to thank, I want to echo what you just said. Um, there's been a lot of work on this over um, a lot more meetings than <laughs> I think we've counted, and and I think that um, our our staff has really worked hard um, to, to really truly do the best that they possibly can for our city. And I know when our community sees these giant numbers, it's really, really scary and disappointing to see how much money we have to pay. Um, but I can say that um, 
I, I know that our staff was just as pained to see us have to pay this amount as well and um, did their best at every moment to make sure that we are paying the least amount and getting the best product out of it. And thank you, Corolla, for, for assisting with that. And I am so elated to see this come to a close. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. All right. Anything? Yeah. <laughs> no. Been there, done that, said that. Um, I, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Again, this is difficult for all of us. We inherited this, as you all know. Um, so um, we're glad to at least be able to close it out at a lower price than what we thought. With that, I will um, make a motion to approve amendment number nine and ask for a second. I'll second that. Thank you. Voice vote, please. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Follick. Thank you, Damaris, and all your team for all the work. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the city clerk for her item. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we have before you consideration of introduction and first reading of an ordinance adding a chapter 2.48 to the Morro Bay Municipal Code relating to the electronic and paperless filing of campaign disclosure statements and statements of economic interest, commonly known as Form 700s. The Political Reform Act requires the filing of various types of statements, reports, and other documents and allows local agencies to require that these filings be submitted electronically with the filing official or the city clerk. Recent legislation requires the clerk to make all campaign reports and statements available on the internet in a format that provides the greatest public access within 72 hours of filing. Historically, council candidates and campaign committees have filed paper statements that are reviewed for accuracy then scanned, redacted, and uploaded to a public portal. Unredacted copies are made available to the public for public viewing upon request, and those original documents are stored and maintained in accordance with the city's record retention schedule. Transparency in campaign financing is critical in order to maintain public trust and support of the political processes. As a means to more cost-effectively process the required filings, the city recently contracted with NetFile, for installation of two electronic programs for online submittal and posting of campaign disclosure statements and Form 700s. While state law does not require the city to adopt an ordinance before mandating Form 700s be filed electronically, which we just implemented this last month, um, it pursuant to government code section 84615, the city council must adopt an ordinance authorizing the complete electronic signature and submission of campaign disclosure forms. Um, using that file for electronic filing improves efficiency, reduces chances for errors and the need to file amendments. It automates the redaction and internet publishing process and eliminates the need for storing and managing paper documents. Streamlining processes like these in an effort to improve efficiency will free up time for staff to address other important initiatives. Should the council wish, um, the recommended action and motion ready statement is um, on your staff report in that recommended actions um, section. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Swanson. Questions for the city clerk? Am I right? To my left, questions? I don't have a question, but a comment. I am a fan of streamlining. <laughs> and I found um, the next file to be um, very user-friendly once I figured it out. Um, and uh, the fact that it combined some forms that we had to do, which was a little bit more complicated one for the county and whatever committee you were on um, that uh, asked for that. So um, um, I will definitely be supporting this. <laughs> My my question is, as you mentioned, it's already available, and we're just basically saying we're okay with that, essentially. Yes, yes the system has been purchased, mm -hmm. but the ordinance needs to be in place in order to require um, those filings be submitted or allow them to be submitted electronically. Wonderful. So they'll be ready. It's, this, will, this is all ready for this upcoming yeah. election. Yeah. Wonderful. And okay. if 
you don't mind, I'll just add that NetFile offers one-on-one -on -one training to all of the treasurers and filers, and they have 24-7 support available if any questions or issues arise as they're using the system. I thought the 24-7 was a city clerk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. With that, I will open public comment on this item. Terry Simons, Madam Mayor, Council, and staff. I did not plan to speak on this issue, but I did hear what I'm concerned about, and that's, is this going to be required or allowed? And the, I thought I heard um, the clerk say required, and then she seemed to change that to allowed. I just wanted to verify that we can still file documents by the, paper, the old paper method, and we're not required to file electronically. Heads up on that. Yes, no, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Betty Winholtz, as someone who's been involved in who knows how many campaigns and running for office, this is a little unsettling for me because uh, my people, being my age, and other aren't necessarily friendly with online computer things. So this bothers me. Um, I feel like it's throwing the work of the city onto the work of the people and that we're going to have to learn new stuff. It's almost like outsourcing. Um, so I'm, I'm not comfortable with it. Um, I, I don't know why we can't do hand things. I actually find out I make more mistakes if I plug numbers into the computer than if I hand write them and then can erase them. So this, this isn't a happy time for me. And so I'm sorry to hear that we're mandating this. Um, I think it, it's, it, um, I understand that there's more requirements for the city clerks than there have been. I also know that um, it, it's difficult already to get treasurers for campaigns and other things. So it's gonna be hard for them. I understand that there's support from them, but it's, um, you know, change. But I, uh, it's electronic change, and so um, that that's my main concern about that. I I want to bring up an issue with the Form 700. Um, one of the uh, committee people came to um, do her form, and if she hadn't done it in a certain amount of time, she was going to be fined. And I find it offensive that a volunteer who's going to give their time to a city commission would be fined if she missed filing her form by a certain date. I think that's wrong. I think you need to fix that. That's not okay. I don't think anybody should be fined when you're volunteering to help out the city. So I don't know where that falls within your this piece of new legislation. And then my final point is it's interesting to me that this is necessarily to come before you, and yet staff did this before it came to you. So I, is that backwards? Should they have come to you first and then bought the, the program or what? Um, that's my final comment. Anyone else for public comment on this item? AGP, are there any raised hands? Hi, Mayor Wixom. There are no raised hands in the queue. Thank you very much. With that, I will close public comment and bring it back to council. Uh, Ms. Swanson, please. So as written, um, the ordinance would not require um, committees who um, raise or spend less than $2,000 on their campaign to file electronically. They can file paper statements. It would require um, those who raise or spend more than 2,000 to file electronically. The council could consider an amendment that would allow the city clerk to make limited exceptions to the requirement. Um, you might choose to make those based on accessibility needs or some specific issue. But what my belief, strong belief, is that with training and support that the filers will find the system much easier to use than the paper documents supplied by the FPPC. They don't have to decide where to put the data. The system intuitively helps them enter it in the right location and then spits out the reports, reducing those errors. So I'm very hopeful that um, with the right support that our filers and treasurers will be pleased and find that it saves them a lot of time in the long run. The um, fines, we don't... We don't establish the fines as they're established by the political or by the FPPC. 
That's a so we have nothing to say on that. No. Thank you. So right now, are we allowing, or do we have a limited time allowed for transition? I know you've offered to help with some training and things, but if somebody, I mean, can we include that? Though I understand that at some point we need to transition to the electronic, but can we have like a time frame to work through the first year or six months or something with this? So the first filing would be due the end of July. So we have quite a bit of time to begin working with treasurers that are, have open committees to help them begin entering any data that or any transactions that have occurred since the first of the year, make sure they feel comfortable with the system prior to having to actually file. Of course, we will have new committees being formed, you know, during the campaign season and we'll work closely with them as well. Okay. Questions, comments to my left? I, I do have a question regarding ac accessibility and um, do you know, Dana, just off the top of your head, if there, if in this training that they will be able to help um, our local governments um, assist folks that may have issues with electronics or don't have access to electronics? Um, you know, is there anything that's been taken into consideration that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I was asked and, and, you know, considered whether the um, computer that's in the front lobby could be potentially used or perhaps at the library. And the, um, the thing that came to mind is treasurers are dealing with a lot of confidential information and I doubt that they would want to do that in a public space. Um, but I think it's something that we need to keep top of mind and be considered about as we move forward. Okay, thank you for that. I don't have any additional questions. So, so if somebody were to bring in paper forms, they won't be accepted? The ordinances written would require electronic statements be filed. Again, it can be edited to give some freedom for the city clerk to make limited exceptions. The system is capable of accepting, mm -hmm. but it what the result of that is that now you're doing the process that you were hoping to eliminate. Okay. You're right. uploading, you're scanning, you're the keeping two separate sure. copies, you're maintaining a paper copy because it has wet signatures. Um, so I would I would hope that we can limit that. I know in attempting to do mine just now, I ran into the snags, but mm -hmm. um, the one advantage or a few of the advantages is serving on multiple committees. Mm -hmm. It allowed it allows for one form to be done for all the committees. And that's certainly for those who are holding multiple um, offices or subcommittees and things that helps a lot as well as it tracks. So I like that because you're not having to start over from scratch each time you can go in and just update the form if nothing changed. So that really is, I see that as, I see the pros and cons. Um, I'm not always computer savvy with things. So I certainly understand what Ms. Winholtz is saying. I'm of that age also, no. Um, to my right, questions, comments? Um, I think it's really, I mean, I see, I, I agree with you. I see both sides. I think it's important to make it accessible for all people though. I think that's really critical. Um, yeah, and then I am just curious um, that, about the last question that was asked about um, um, purchasing the program before. Like, did you need did did we need to approve this, or did because it was purchased before we approved it? The contract itself is three thousand nine hundred per year, so it was approved by the city manager. Um, so she authorized the implementation of this program, which is you know again to file the form seven hundreds, which don't require this ordinance campaign statements and then it will um there's a separate module for um, ethics training um and again the, the ordinance is required to be passed for the electronic submission of any campaign statements whether it's a requirement or an option this ordinance would need to be passed thank you yeah, i think once we get used I think once we get used to it we'll definitely streamline the process it's just making that transition is always difficult um, and if there are any questions anybody has of the city manager, she's also back online. Um, but 
If we're seeing none, I will ask for a motion. I move that we um, pass an, um, item 9C with the amendment for the clerk to make exceptions for accessibility. Any um, time limit on that? I believe we need you to read the full title of the ordinance as is listed in the um, yeah, recommended computer. action on the agenda and um, okay. the amendment is heard. Okay. Um, I, I'd recommend if, if we're going to be changing the wording of this ordinance, then uh, unless the city clerk actually has that amendment before her right now or is comfortable with this, then we could bring this back to the next meeting with that language because this is going to be codified. So I'm not exactly sure where it would go in here. Um, we have a proposal for a new uh, chapter 2.48 to the Morro Bay Municipal Code and uh, to add accessibility language in here is something that I would suggest that we actually like think about the exact words, put it in there and just bring it back at the next meeting. Um, unless the city clerk believes that it's sufficient to just amend this ordinance with intent. I'm fine with bringing it back at the next meeting. Is, would that be like consent? Like we could just approve that in consent or? Uh, you just need to do uh, a first reading or a second reading verbally, but um, we don't have to go through uh, the whole presentation, but um, we would need to have an actual motion and, you know, reading of the title and everything. Well, it's probably best to do that. Okay, I, I, let's stop this for one second. I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Oh. I'll second that with okay, the accessibility for conversation. Thank you. Um, can we just provide direction without amending it? It's not something we're going to do the long term. And I also realize that all the municipalities, the state, the county, and everything have all transitioned to right. this. So it's it's all linked. If we're asking her to bring it back with accessibility, do we need to define what we're talking about? Well, I think or just a general direction. <laughs> direction. Just want to make sure we do this the best that help you know, the best way to help you. Didn't you didn't you have language that you used? I thought that was fine. And um I I mean I think I, I would think that uh, it could be something that, uh, based on the language the city clerk had offered before, mm -hmm. where if somebody makes a request, then at the city clerk's reasonable discretion, mm -hmm. uh, then paper forms could be filed. Uh, I'd hesitate, since this is going to be codified in the city's municipal code, to just not know exactly what the language is. That's why I'm suggesting we bring it back, because this is memorialized in our code. So. Um, I'm pretty sure that staff would be able to move this along quickly at the next meeting. We've already had the staff report. We would just have the ordinance with the modifications you all are suggesting. I think I'm just concerned about it not having an end date or something that this just as as she's sharing the, the whole goal of this is to transition to a, the electronic. So it's sure, never we, ending. You could maybe say that that's it, what I'm. The accessibility thing ends in X amount of time. I thought it's just it's just for certain people that don't have computer access. It doesn't necessarily end. Most people would do it the electronic way. Yeah. It's just for it's just for the people that don't. Any any way in on that, City Clerk? Um, in talking with the consultant, it is not unusual for a city to include language that would allow for very limited exceptions to the requirement Perfect. for electronic filing. Perfect. Uh, and I'm okay with that. And we could bring it back at the next meeting. It would be a business item so that you can read the full title, but we can show them that it's in red line. So it's very obvious what has changed. Great. That's Thank limiting you. Time. I know we have a heavy agenda coming up in the next several meetings, so we can keep it very brief. Move it through pretty quick. So do we need to withdraw the motion or does the motion die for lack of action? Either way. Uh, I, I guess uh, formally withdraw the motion because otherwise you would be. Thank you. Okay. Should be doing so it I'll uh, withdraw the withdraw. motion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that update. And um, hopefully we can push that through quicker. Council declaration of future agenda items. To my left, to my right. Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you so much.
What time is it? Oh my goodness. It's only, it's not quite 7.30. I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. 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 I do yeah, I'm going to be in the 